Great cartoons, among the voices, among other things I do. And it's the most fun in the world, as you'll see. Uh, let me introduce you to our six people here today. We have on the far right, this is Mr. Phil Morris. Okay, and, I also, and I also want each of you to do one really obscure thing, some voice, it can be, and that can be a voiceover, a commercial, a looping job, or anything like that, that nobody knows you did. You're okay. Some secret. Phil? That's a lot. Um, <laughs> happy to start it off for y'all. Here we go. Um, I did uh, Justice League Doom. I was Mandel Savage in that. Uh, very cool. Um, what? Bold and beautiful, bold and beautiful. That's, that's my young and restless days. Uh, Batman Brave and Bold. I played a couple of characters on that. Jonah Hex. Uh, I have a couple of Justice League Lego things coming out. And uh, what, uh, the, the Lego Scooby Doo coming out. Um, a couple of those. And then uh, here's my obscure voice. There was a show back in the day called The PJs that Eddie Murphy created. <laughs> y'all are cool. Y'all are real cool. Okay, you go with me. You go with me. So Eddie, being Eddie, was like, I don't want to come from Orange, New Jersey to do this voice no more. Can you get somebody to do the voice? So I got the call. And I did uh, Thurgood Stubbs for the last two seasons that it was on. Uh, so Thurgood sounds a little like this. Hmm. People here at the Comic-Con, y'all are cool. <laughs> Raphael kind of got it on, and uh, 
she was she was uh, kind of involved with him, and she was like, "Hey, what am I, fish food? I can top any of you hard show weasel heads in a hot second." <laughs> and I guess the one you wouldn't know is that I'm a pig. Um, I am one of the three little pigs for Disney. So, Fiddler Pig. It was started back in the 19. I want to say 30s or 40s, and of course those pigs are long gone. So whenever there's a call for a pig, fiddler pig, you know. I built my house with sticks. I built my house with sticks. But I hate diddle diddle and I play on my fiddle and I dance all kinds of jigs. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Many other things Pat does, she's one of the best teachers of improv comedy around. And uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit later about how to get into the business a bit. One of the great things that voice actors can do is study improv comedy. A lot of people, the best people came out of that. Pat, tell, tell a little bit about what you do. Um, the woman who created all the improvisational games from the, for the theater, her name was Viola Spoon. Not too many people know who she is these days, but she... Thank you. <laughs> she created theater games, and from those theater games came Second City, came UCB, came uh, every single improv group, all the guys on Saturday Night Live, you know, they all played theater games initially. I was lucky enough to study with Viola herself. She was 83, and we were the last group to study with her before she died, and one of the things that she said to me one day was, I want you to teach. And I'm like, oh, 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 no, no, no. I'm teaching. I'm teaching. <laughs> I've got a new young group coming up. They're playing theater games. We don't have any set pieces at all, unlike other improv groups. And uh, this new young group is going to start playing soon. We're already playing. We're just Baldwin players, and we've been playing together for over 30 years.
I say to you, more Asian, more... <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, you know, because of the, the 70s and the movement towards diversity and more uh, encompassing all peoples, I would always get people to say, no, we don't want that accent. But growing up in Hawaii, I grew up in an immigrant population, and we, I never spoke, I, I spoke in a native patois. So, I mean, when I first came, I had an accent. And uh, at that time, my people was were trying to integrate into the mainstream, so they were trying to speak that standard American speech, which I had to learn when I came here, because when I came here, I was talking like, what's the matter you? What's the matter me? You don't want the matter. <laughs> so, so uh, the, the producers wanted authenticity, but they also didn't want it to sound stereotyped. So we developed this type of kind of uh, in ground in between, you know, storm shot. <laughs> so not too stereotyped, but not but you know, indicative of the culture. And that was my forte because I knew my culture very well. I had studied it, that was my thing. And in Hawaii, we are considered the majority and not the minority. So we're sort of precocious, you know, in that sense. We made the rules. You talk our way, or no way. <laughs> we had the country. <laughs> Everything you just said about the whole, you know, the Asian uh, stereotypes and all that stuff, I get that as well. And, and uh, you know, you kind of have to just take what they give you and kind of just make it your own and kind of just make it as as creative and non-offensive and, and kind of general for everybody. So it's a, it's a bit of a, a tough thing to do, uh, but whatever puts gas in the tank, I guess. <laughs> Uh, I do the voice of Girly Bag on Uncle Grey and Pa. You guys have seen that guy? He's the, he's the talking fanny pack that's around the waist of Uncle G. Uh, I do the voice of Medusa on Breadwinners. He likes to deliver bread to other ducks. When Antonio is too busy, Antonio. <laughs> and the voice of Puss in Boots. Uh, I do a, a pretty good Paul Giamatti on Turbo Fans. <laughs> the, the key to a good Paul Giamatti is you have to pretend like you're trying to eat your own neck. <laughs> you're, you're, you're trying to hide your own shoulders. <laughs> yeah. If he's here, he's probably like, they're done. <laughs> <laughs> I do Marvin the Martian. Isn't that lovely? <laughs> I've had the opportunity to do it recently for, for Nike. Uh, so I'll find you, Blake Griffin, and your Superfly 4s. <laughs> uh, speaking of Asian, I do Tiger Claw <coughs> on Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. <laughs> as well as a new villain, Hulk, which is a very close impression of Bruce Lee. You put water in the cup, it becomes the cup. <laughs> You put water in a picture, becomes the picture. Put people in convention hall, it becomes Comic Con. Uh, one, one obscure voice that I've done, and, I, and it's obscure to me because I never book commercials. Uh, I got to do uh, a voiceover tag for uh, Scooby Doo State Farm. They did those State Farm commercials. I was the guy at the end saying, "Let State Farm uh, get you there." To improve your state. It was basically my uh, my Don Nessick impression from <laughs> from uh, uh, Johnny Quest. Isn't that right, Haji? Johnny, you got to stay close to race. He's there to protect us. <laughs> Be up here without. That's why I said he's my my father, is because I got to play Storm Shadow in one incarnation of GI Joe Resolute. That was done by uh, Joaquin De Santos, who did uh, Avatar. So yeah, I did I did that. Hi, I'm Jessica Chico. Uh, it's funny. I was on Mighty B also. I don't. I wonder if you played my dad. Because I played Gwen 
actually played the Chinese uh, girl character. Like, oh, Bessie, more like Nessie stinking bottom. Ooh. <laughs> um, anybody, any Adventure Time fans? <laughs> Queen Princess on that show. You would defy nature for me? Then we're only gonna hurt each other. <laughs> um, Gravity Falls, anybody? Okay, I play the psycho dating sim, Giffany. You're my boyfriend now, Zeus. Ha ha, ha ha. I will love you forever. Um, I also played Tambry on that show. She's the one who's like, always on the phone. She just doesn't care. Status update, Comic-Con. <laughs> um, Final Fantasy, I was in um, Lightning Returns, I played Lumina. Yeah. Anybody played that one? Yeah. Um, she's like, you should listen to her. She always tells the truth. Um, oh, I also played like a little Moogle in that. Um, oh, cool bowl. <laughs> Um, I was uh, Olette in Kingdom Hearts 2, and uh, anybody remember The Emperor's New School on Disney Channel? Nice! I played Melina on that show. Cusco, you're gonna have to give a little on this one. Um, um, I'm also on, oh yeah, and Buzz on Nagi. I, that was my first show. I played Maggie on that show. That was like a welcome to animation, um, especially because like Charlie Adler directed that show. <laughs> These guys know what I'm talking about. There's no trail uh, Adler in it. Yeah, he played cow and chicken. Um, yeah, he's also a director and he's awesome. Um, uh, Sheriff Callie's Wild West, Disney Junior Show. I play... Nice, all right. I play um, Toby on that show. So he's a... Uh, Will? Oh, Pick. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to break you. I'm a pokey little cow poke. <laughs> And uh, Patches from the Super Secret Pup Club in uh, Pound Puppies. I'm Patches. I'm part of the Super Secret Pup Club. Um, oh, I just did a Sims video game, so I spoke Simish for like about a year straight recording that. Oh, and for any Adventure Time fans, um, there was two uh, Sim kids on Sims, and it ha just so happened to be me and Hinden Walsh who plays Bubblegum. So Princess Bubblegum and uh, Flame Princess, we did like the kids on Sims. She's like, him boy shoot you, Markel. Didn't, had no idea what we were saying the entire time. <laughs> <laughs> um, I also do Nick Jr. promos. So whenever you hear, um, coming up next, Dora the Explorer. Don't go away, right here on Nick Jr. <laughs> I started doing radio imaging, so when you hear, like, uh, I'm the voice for the, the, I'm the female voice for the uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, radio station. Hot 995, D.C.'s number one hit music station. <laughs> um, yeah, and then I have some cool things coming out. I'm going to be in the show Loud House on Nickelodeon, so I'm really excited about that. I think they're having the world premiere here at Comic-Con uh, tomorrow. I play two main characters on that, so I'm excited for that. And um, I just joined the cast of X-Ray and Babe, uh, X-Ray and Babe, sorry, on uh, the YouTube channel Rooster Teeth. So that's exciting. Yeah, I'm really excited to start to branch out. And I started doing anime too. So I'm going to be in um, Fate Stay Night. That's, um, yeah. And um, Do Ra Ra too. And, and is there a show you aren't on? <laughs> somebody Sorry. called uh, a guy who went out today when I mentioned it said like this big Lego fan. He said, I met you on the panel, he said, We've got you got super brawl in there. Are you? I can neither confirm nor deny that. <laughs> ah. <laughs> what? No? Okay, Are you playing <laughs> Are you playing uh, uh, Batman for the Lego people? I'm not playing Batman. Okay, you can deny no. that. Alright. I can I can oh yeah. Josh Robert Thompson, and I was Jeff Peterson on the Late Late Show. Bulls. 
That's pretty much all I can say. I don't think I can say anymore. Uh, yes, I was. I puppeteered. Uh, do Jeff Peterson's voice is kind of a George Takei. That was sort of uh, how it started. Uh, and I would puppeteer the robot at the same time while we were improvising things. At the same time, I had another remote control device that I would use to puppeteer the rhino head above the fireplace. The name of the rhino was Sandra, but she talked like this. Hey, you doing? I'm Sandra the Rhino. Nice, nice to see you. Sometimes Craig Ferguson would say, Oh, Jeff, why don't you talk to Sandra at the same time? <laughs> well, certainly I will. How are you, Sandra? Pretty good. How you doing? Not too bad. All right, good to see you. Nice to see you. Good to see you, too. Oh, very nice, Josh. <laughs> Now, in addition to that, on the same show, I would make this old-time uh, telephone on Craig's desk. I would make it ring. There was a button on the floor that I would push with my foot. I had much control on that show. <laughs> and he'd always say, well, let's take a phone call. Who could it be? And it would always be some different celebrity. Morgan Freeman would sometimes call him. <laughs> Hello, it's Morgan Freeman. Looking out of the sea of people here at Comic Con. <laughs> Some of them waiting hours to get in here. Most of them sweaty, smelling foul. <laughs> That's the smell of Comic Con, as you smell it. <laughs> Sometimes I wouldn't play a mason. I'd say, listen to me very carefully. I don't know who you are, but I'm going to find you. <laughs> So in addition to that, we had a number of flies that would come into the studio, celebrity flies. Jay Leno. Jay Leno, thank you, ma'am. I appreciate that. You're ahead of me already. <laughs> <laughs> and then the Jimmy Fallon fly. Oh, it's so great. Wow, it's so cool. Wow, look at that. What's a shiny object? Neat. Wow, awesome. Cool. Wow, wow. <laughs> then I was the voices of all of the fictitious band members behind this plush red curtain, the Shy Fellas Band. Alfredo Sauce and the Shy Fellas Band. <laughs> we started adding band members. This is all improvised. I had a list on this wall, a big piece of paper. Every time I would say a new band member name, I had to write it down. There were 15 band members. <laughs> and I think I also did the voice of Secretary of the Horse. Oh. Uh, as Morgan Freeman. That's not <laughs> Uh, here's an obscure one for you, and I was doing this yesterday, and many of you may not have even realized it, but yesterday I was walking around as George Lucas. Uh, if you saw George Lucas walking around with the full goiter, and uh, I was holding a picket sign that said, Greedo shot first. <laughs> and that upset a lot of people. <laughs> I have to tell you very briefly, I was... I was out in front of the, the big, uh, with the Lucasfilm presentation yesterday, and watching the people filing, and these people have been out there for a couple of days waiting to go to this. I'm standing there as George Lucas saying, anybody just give me a wristband? Uh, I gave you so much. Uh... <laughs> I'll take it back. I'll take back Jar Jar and the prequels. Just give me a wristband, please. <laughs> Every single person walking by, this was the expression. <laughs> Shows where you took a couple weeks off and like Larry King was doing <laughs> Jeff. That's right. They put suspenders on Jeff. <laughs> so Larry King is hidden behind the wall where I am, but they have another guy puppeteering. Because Larry's like, I'm not gonna puppeteer. You know? So <laughs> it was Larry King's voice coming out of Jeff the Robot. It was pretty people said for a while, I think your job might be on the line, bro. <laughs> pretty interesting. Pretty weird to see that. All right, tell us about some of the animation stuff you've done. Uh, well, let's see, Final Fantasy 13. I think I was a guy named Rigdy, who was, oh, somebody's very upset about that, he was a bad person. But they, but they want, I think Square Enix wanted them to sound like Sawyer from Lost. At the time, they were big fans of Lost. So it was just like, hey, Freckles, all right. And then it sounded like Matthew McConaughey, all right. All right. That's right, I'm the bad guy in this story, all right. Take the shirts off and play bongo. <laughs> uh, but other weird things like um, Call of Duty, uh, World at War, there was, uh, I think, a Nazi zombie level, which is always my favorite thing. 
big fan of horror movies, so there were a lot. There was the Nazi uh, zombie genre was pretty big in the 80s. So that was just a lot of screaming and yelling and things like that. Uh, I don't remember anything else. I was too busy thinking like Morgan Freeman. <laughs> Who, who did you, I'm working on that show, who did you meet that really excited you? So, Carol Burnett. Yeah! yeah. Uh, on the Late Late Show with Craig Ferguson, Carol Burnett wanted to meet me, which I, this is my favorite moment, I think, ever in, in show business and will ever be, I think, because I grew up watching Carol Burnett and Friends as a kid, and that's how I got into improv and, and playing characters, and uh, she wanted to meet the guy that played that robot thing. That's, that's what she said. And uh, she came over to my little station where I puppeteered and did the voice and she gave me a big hug and whispered in my ear and said, you are one of very few people that do this sort of thing. Uh, welcome to the club. So I think that pretty much uh, was it for me. <laughs> you know, very sweet woman. And, uh, and John Rickles too, John Rickles. John Rickles came up to me and said, you know, I, I didn't realize that you, you were the voice of the robot. How do you like that? A dummy operating a dummy. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. The robot is now in storage. The robot is now in a storage facility in Van Nuys. So show business is uh, great. <laughs> no, he's in one of his many places. Show places. Let's go back up. I want to introduce you to tell me about somebody you worked with. You were really impressed to, to meet somebody that you walked into the recording session, and the other microphone is. Jessica, who, who, who are you really excited about? Oh my god, I remember one of my first, um, my first jobs out here, I mean, in LA, um, I did an episode of All Grown Up, which is, you know, a spin-off of Rugrats. So I grew up watching Rugrats, and um, I, did, I was doing a guest star on All Grown Up, and I was not expecting this. I walked into the room, and there was, like, all my heroes, like, all my voiceover heroes, it was, um, and, and the one I was just like, oh my god, it was Nancy Cartwright. I was like, I was obsessed with the Simpsons, I was obsessed. That just blew my mind. She was playing Chucky. Uh, she took over Chucky. Um, and then Tara Strong, E.G. Daly. Um, I think, oh yeah, Kat Susie was in the room. So I was just, I was just blown away the whole session. Uh, the late great Gary Owens. I got to I walk into a room and Larry was sitting on the couch and just goes right into when we were recording Roger Ramjet, the Rat Pack were next door recording their album. So sometimes farmer number one would be Dino, or dog number two would be old blue eyes. And it's just like pooping my pants. <laughs> Gary Owens telling me this great stories, and I'm just like, crap, I'll remember that day for the rest of my life. <coughs> I was going to mention, uh, later, but it's a better time to do it now, we're kind of devoting, dedicating the voice panels this weekend to two men we lost in the last few months who were, who were on the voice panels at various times. One of them was Gary Owens, who was the, one of the nicest men. Yeah, yeah. I got it to be on one of the panels here, he was like two minutes late, which was incredible for Gary. And what had happened was his car had been stolen. Oh. He checked it, he came down to the convention, he went to the uh, embassy suites, uh, and, so, and he parked his, his Mercedes, and went up to the room, and a kid, a Hispanic kid, no less, comes up and says, I'm Gary Owen's son, uh, I, I want his car. And they go, okay, and they gave him the keys to it, and he drove off. <laughs> Uh, apparently the guy did had his hand over his ear or something like that. And Gary filled out the police report and came running in and he was apologetic. He was two minutes late. He was just wonderful in that and wonderful in everything he did. And the other guy we lost recently was, was a man named Mr. Stan Freeberg. Stan Freeberg did his very first cartoon voice on Looney Tunes in 1945. The last cartoon he did is a Garfield episode that I voice directed that will air in, on the Cartoon Network in October, a span of 70 years. No one is ever going to top that. And he was in tons of Warner Brothers cartoons, and he was the original voice of Cecil the Sea Six Sea Serpent, and he was in Lady and the Tramp, and it just a, and, and that was like one part of what he did. If you are interested in great voice work, find a record called Sam Freeberg Presents the United States of America. There you are. <laughs> What's your recommendation for it? Who have you worked with who, who... Well, I had a long career from the 60s, so I've worked with a lot of great people, but 
I started in, in Walla Hoops. And Sign I don't know if you're really mm -hmm. not, but yeah. Uh, well, yeah. That added to the, to the soundtrack, the uh, extemporaneous, the, the outside sounds of uh, the, the environment. Uh, and two guys that I worked with, who was starting out then was Phil Hartman and uh, Robin Williams. Oh. And, uh, and we go into the sound booth, we go into the booth, you know, and, they, and you just couldn't get in a word in. These guys were just so brilliant. I, and you know, it was all improv, and we were making up these voices on the side, in, 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 a, in, a, in a room at a party. And these guys were just brilliant. And I was fortunate that once they moved into a Chinese restaurant, those guys couldn't really compete with me. <laughs> but I learned a lot from them. I learned that you had to be good, you had to be quick in order to compete. And two other guys I'd like to mention who I eventually worked with who made me fall in love with voice people and working in the voice genre. And that was, uh, that was I met Frank Welker. Kind of I went into a room and they said, Frank, we need a sound of a rocking chair here and he said well what kind is it <laughs> is it a grandmother grandfather type of rocking chair is it made of wood was it made of metal? And, and he'd just go on and he would create all these different sounds and I knew I had a lot of work <laughs> and the other one was Don Messick who was uh, the original <laughs> voice was so we do and and he took me and he kind of guided me through my career. I worked with him on a couple, on a couple projects. And it showed to me the humanism of, uh, of the, you know, because in the 60s and 70s, it was pretty competitive. It was pretty cutthroat then. Um, and uh, those two people, Frank and Don, showed me that you could be really a good person and be a creative, skilled talent at the same time. You mentioned, you mentioned, well, let's show these people what a Walla Group does. We've got, we got six people here. Um, I'll give you a situation. You just do the Walla for this, okay? Here's a quiet, dignified party. Do a little, everybody do a little, little we're at a quiet, dignified party. <laughs> now we're at the raucous party. <laughs>
it, and it only got worse from there. <laughs> Great. That's what conversations yeah. with him were right. like. Um, um, I grew up with one of the greatest voiceover talents I ever met. My father, Greg Morris. Oh. Uh, in the original Mission Impossible series, not the Tom Cruise movies, but the good stuff. Uh, I can say it. I'm like, a... <laughs> But I've met so many of the greatest voiceover people that have ever walked. Sidney Poitier, um, um, uh, Paul Fries was one of my uncle. Uncle Paul would call us and talk to us as the Pillsbury Doughboy. Dough um, one of my first jobs was with Frank Welker. So Frank is one of these stalwarts. Um, I, I think in one of my first voiceover sessions there was Powers Booth and Alfred Molina. Um, you know what I like about some of the actor, the face actors that come do voiceover, and I kind of consider myself one of them, we gain an incredible amount of respect for what voiceover actors do. I am now one, they've accepted me in this fold, but I have to speak on the brilliance of the vocal, vocal talents that are here and the ones that we've worked with, because it's a whole different kettle of fish than what I do in front of a camera. And when you hear their voices and you see these and hear these wonderful characterizations, it's, it's just all with their voice, man, and all with their, their placement and their references, and it is, it is always mind-boggling to me to work with a Fred Tattashore, or, or a Nolan North, or a Yuri Lowenthal, or, you know, Corey Burton, or, I mean, you have to understand there's so many amazing people now that um, I am very, very fortunate to work with a lot of them. Work with Jessica, um, we had Pat Morita, who was the original Mr. Miyagi, come play in a show that I did for Secret Saturdays um, for Cartoon Network, and, um, so, I mean, we could go on and on and on, but, but suffice to say that a lot of these talent, for me, my dad was the greatest. Greg Morris, to me, was the greatest. So, uh, I always have to honor him and give him his respect. You watching, kid? Because we're hearing you in your name. <laughs> so, yeah, Greg Morris is the name I'm going to leave everybody with. Thank you. Is Ben Tavishaw still here? Is Ben here? Okay, I heard, I heard Greg Berger laughing someplace. Is Greg here? Yeah. This is Greg Berger, ladies and gentlemen. What table are you sitting at downstairs? 5619. 5619. Go down to the Odie and Grimlock and about 95 other characters. All in one place here. All right. Uh, we're going to do what's called the cold reading. Uh, these people have never seen this script before, and by that I mean they've never seen this script before, and you've never heard this script before. We're bringing in a brand new one tonight. First, I have to ask you who here, who here is good at dog barks? Okay, good. You, you got it. All right. Okay, good. All right. Um, I'm going I'm to be assigning the one that I've not seen the script, and uh, we're going to attempt now to do, in 100 lines of dialogue, the complete story of The Wizard of Oz. <laughs> <laughs> first things first, is we need pencils, because a voice actor is nothing without a pencil. Mark, hey. carefully pass the pencils out to the <laughs> <laughs> Making sure that they start themselves. Now, I am assigning the roles. Okay, Josh? Now, now what we're going to do in this script is, because we can't switch from color to black and white, we're going to have one narrator for the Kansas sequence, and one narrator for the Oz sequence. And we're going to go back and forth, because it, it starts in Kansas and it ends in Kansas. You got that? Josh, you're going to be the Oz narrator. And I'm going to like every line you do in a different voice. Okay. All right. All right. Jessica, congratulations. You're Dorothy. <laughs> Eric, you are the Scarecrow, Uncle Henry, and the Munchkin Mayor. And at various times, everyone's going to be a Munchkin. You're, you're the Kansas narrator and the Tin Man. Okay. Pat, are you a good witch or a bad witch? You get to be both. <laughs> so, Randy Ann and a Munchkin Woman. And Phil, you get to be the Cowardly Lion, the Wizard, and Toto. <laughs> Time to mark their scripts. I'm going to do a brief commercial. 
Uh, there are probably some people in this room who are interested in careers in voiceover business. You'd like these people's jobs. We do a special panel every year on Sunday. It's at 3 o'clock in room 25 ABC. It's called The Business of Cartoon Voices. This is not up for entertainment. This is for people who are serious and want real information about how to get into the, the, the voiceover business. The reason we do this is I have a pet gripe about voice coaches and people out there who charge kids an enormous amount of money without giving them very useful information. There are some wonderful voice coaches out there and people who teach who are terrific. There are also some people who I think are very predatory and who will charge you several thousand dollars to learn everything you can learn at this panel tomorrow. It's in room 25 ABC. I'm going to have two voice actors uh, talking about their careers, Misty Lee and Bob Bergen. And I managed to get down here for, for years. I wanted out down here one of the best voiceover agents in the business, man, a gentleman named Paul. Is Paul here someplace? Paul, this is the this is this is Frank Welker's agent. This is Neil Ross. This is the this is the one of the top voiceover agents. This is CESD. This is the D. Wow. Mr. Paul Dory. ABC tomorrow at 3 o'clock. If you're interested in career, we're going to tell you an awful lot of stuff, some of which you won't want to hear, but you should. All right, you have had not enough time to mark your scripts, people. We're going to start it anyway. Now, one more piece of information here direction. While we are in Kansas, which we will be until uh, line 14, I would like this read seriously like a real dramatic uh, reading, and we will follow the dialogue exactly. After that, when we get to Oz, you can do whatever you want. And if you don't like the voice you are doing at any given moment, just change it. Right? All right, we're going to start here. And I believe, Keone, you have. Once upon a time, there was a little girl named Dorothy who lived in a farm in Kansas with her uncle Henry. Her auntie Emma and a little dog called Toto. One day, Dorothy was outside for Toto when her aunt and uncle called to her. Dorothy, stop playing with that dog and get inside. The tornado is coming. Oh, Toto, look at those black clouds. It's a two headed dog. Hurry, Dorothy. Get into the basement with your uncle and me. But Toto ran away, and Dorothy chased after him. <laughs> Toto, come back here! Alas, Dorothy and Toto didn't get into the basement in time. They had to take refuge in a small house on the property which they did, just before the tornado struck and ripped the house off its foundation. <laughs> the tornado carried the little house high into the sky and up over the rainbow, coming to rest in another world, and on top of a wicked witch. Toto, I don't think we're in Kansas anymore. She and her dog stepped out into the beautiful, colorful world where they were greeted by little people as far as the eyes could see. There's a lot more munchkins. Let's have it. Just one more time. A lot of munchkins. Who are all of you? We're the munchkins, and we want to thank you. You see, you dropped a house of the, of the Wicked Witch of the East. You killed her! And you killed her dead. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's dead. <laughs> You've made the munchkins very happy, my dear. Welcome. I am the good witch of the north. My name is Dorothy, and this is Toto. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Wiggs waved a wand and magic. <laughs> Listening red slippers appeared on Dorothy's feet. Oh. Suddenly, <laughs> suddenly a bolt of lightning. What are you looking at? Suddenly a bolt of lightning and chill filled the skies. Just a little bit. Did you want us to put the oil? Everywhere! <laughs> oh, hold on, buddy. <laughs> Maybe we just met. <laughs> oh! <laughs> so Dorothy oiled him up, and before long, he could talk and move again. Oh. Thank you. Uh, but what good is it to be able to talk and move when I lack the most important thing in life? Do you know what that is? My brain? No! Uh -huh. There's nothing in there. Come with us. We're going to ask the great wizard to make our wishes come true. I'm sure the Tin Man joined our little party. <laughs> And off they headed down the yellow brick road until they ran into a lion, cheeky monkeys, who... Uh, raw, sucker! <laughs> A very cowardly lion. <laughs> Right 
them <clears throat> like I wish I had. <laughs> And then back they went to the castle, but it's so proud. This is fantastic, the story is great. I have to tell you, of all the stories that I've done, this one is the most recent. <laughs> so anyway, shut up, listen to me. So they went to the castle where they soon found all the great and powerful fantastic guys who's not all that great or powerful. Like me. Yeah, exactly. Go ahead. <laughs> No, no, I'm just a traveling salesman who made a wrong turn and wound up here. I don't have any magical powers. You don't? You wish then that the good witch suddenly appeared. Dorothy, you have the magic. You've always had it in those cute little cups. Huh? I do? Yes, you've had it all along. Just click your heels three times and make that wish. Do it, Dorothy. I'll make sure your friends make a brain and a heart and whatever else they want. <laughs> Dorothy clicked her heels three times. <laughs> and before she knew it, as she was walking up with two f familiar faces before her. Auntie Em, Uncle Henry, where am I? Well, you're home, dear. Where else would you be? Let me say that, Aunt. You are safe in your own little bed. Right here in Kansas City. Oh, it's so good to be back. There's no place like Comic Con. There's no place like Comic Con. There's no place like Comic Con.